that I'm giving this talk from the original land of the Awaswas people of the Ohlone tribe, which is now maintained by the Amamutsan people of the Ohlone tribe of indigenous people, which we know as Santa Cruz. Um, so I am acknowledging that now. Khan. This is my talk that is maybe a little chaotic, but uh, this seems to me like the easiest and most expedient way to make this video and talk to you today. Uh, my name is Misha Cardenas, Dr. Misha Cardenas. I am a professor at University of California, Santa Cruz, and I am an artist and theorist. Uh, I teach digital arts and new media. I teach... Uh, in the Games and Playable Media program, and I teach Critical Race and Ethnic Studies. And I'm so happy to be talking to you today about my game, Seen Soul, and my new game, which is a little more than a spark in my eye, uh, Oceanic. Um, I'm so honored to be invited here today, so thank you so much to all the organizers of QGCon this year. Uh, I'm so glad that we could proceed and do this despite the pandemic. Um, which is to say, yo, we are in a pandemic, y'all. Uh, it's amazing that we're still, we're still able to do things like this. Um, so I hope you'll forgive the chaoticness of it, but also I hope that it could be, uh, sustaining and maybe inspiring. And, and giving some energy in this really, really sad and difficult time when um, so many people have died from this virus. Um, I hope that the work is relevant. Uh, and I think it is. So um, what I want to do is show a little bit of the documentation of Seen Soul. Um, Seen Soul means no sun. Uh, it's a game that is available on the App Store for iOS devices, for iOS and iPhone. So uh, please go download it and play it. Uh, download it, put it on your phone, go outside and play it. Um, it will be a much more rich experience than just seeing clips of it now. But what I'm thinking about doing is uh, showing some clips and then showing some of the development of this work. Um, so some of the behind the scenes. Some things that I never intended to share with the world, but hey, look at you. Um, so let's see a little bit of Scene Soul.
Okay, so, um, this is a game about being stuck inside, about being unable to breathe, about having to wear a mask when you go outside, and about being stuck inside for a long time, where my only companion was my dog, Roja, who you probably just heard scratching. Come here, babe! Come here! Because she is here right now. Come up here! Come up! Come up! Yeah! Here's Roja. Good girl. Um, and... Um, yeah, so I was living in Seattle, it was 2017, and there were huge wildfires in British Columbia. Huge, historic, unprecedented wildfires in British Columbia that were sending so much smoke that literally we just woke up one day in Seattle to the sky black, and there being no, you couldn't see the sun, and it was dark. And, uh, that continued for weeks. And the news agencies said, uh, people with, uh, chronic respiratory illness, people with asthma, like me, should stay inside because the air quality was very dangerous. Um, so I did. I had to stay inside for those two weeks. Uh, and Roja was uh, my only companion and the only reason that I left the house. So I started writing these poems at that point. And um, I started writing the poems and developing the movement. And uh, yeah. I was trying to develop them together. Um, and a lot of times in my work, the poetry comes first, and then the game becomes a sort of vehicle for portraying or sharing the poetry. Um, so I thought I wanted to use augmented reality for a number of reasons. Um, I've been interested in multiple realities for a long time. Um, I wrote a book called The Trans Real uh, in 2012 about artists working in multiple realities and different ways that artists do that, um, like myself and Mez Breeze and the Electronic Disturbance Theater and uh, Stellark um, and Blast Theory, big inspiration there. Um, and so, uh, but, you know, over time, uh, especially in 2017, uh, augmented reality was really coming to platforms like iOS and uh, ARKit was pretty new then. Um, ARKit being a, an API that you can use to make your own AR apps on iOS. Um, so, uh, yeah, we used the ARKit template that I found online, an open source one, uh, and that was MIT licensed, and, um, and started putting together a, an AR app. Um, but first I wrote the poems and developed the movement, and I was teaching at University of Washington Bothell at the time, near Seattle, um, and so I tried to involve my students uh, in the process. Um, and um, one of the those students was Morgan Thomas. Uh, Morgan Thomas is on Twitter as Mormadillus, I think, M-O-R-M-A-D-I-L-L-U-S, I could be wrong. But if you go to my Twitter account, Misha Cardenas, um, I'm retweeting Morgan all the time. And uh, the Critical Reality Studio is also, lots of our tweets include Morgan's handle. So you can find them there. Um, uh, so I went to Morgan with a stack of poems, and I was like, Morgan, okay. My idea is I want to make a translatina AI. And uh, I was really inspired also by Sasha Costanza Chalk's workshop on transfeminist AI at the... Institute of Contemporary Art in Chicago, where we were showing our work uh, alongside each other. Um, and so I went to Morgan with this idea and, um, you know, just some ideas about outfits, like I wanted something femme and, um, you know, a skirt and boots we talked about. And, um, and, and I gave them the poems with the character. Um, and then we basically did a kind of iterative design process where um, Morgan gave me these drawings and uh, then um, I was like, how about a little more of this and a little bit less of that. And um, then let's see, then Morgan gave me some more sketches with some effects um, that, uh, that ended up being the particle effects that are in the game. Um, but, um, you know, Morgan's a brilliant artist, so drawing these different poses thinking about different kinds of glitch, like butterfly glitches. Because my idea from the beginning was um, a trans Latinx AI would be an AI who was breaking out of her gendered programming, who was uh, being, you know, a neural network being trained to be male, who was like, no, 
I won't do that. Um, and so I was thinking about a kind of like a navigational AI, you know, a, a very, very compliant AI that was breaking out of their programming and then having all these memories coming back. So the game is set 60 years in the future based on an actual UN report that said that we only have, if global, global warming continues as it is, that we only have 60 years left of uh, time in which we can grow food on the earth. Um, so that was a pretty dire report that got very little news attention, so I set the story then to call some attention to that. Um, and Morgan gave me more amazing drawings. Um, we kept iterating, and um, Morgan came up with all these amazing ideas like hollow limbs and, you know, animated dresses and um, cables that were part of the outfit and, you know, hologram horns. So many different amazing, amazing outfits that I wish we could have made. Um, and some, some movement sketches based on the movements that I was describing to Morgan. Um, and after a number of iterations and feedback from me and rounds, we ended up, we decided to go with this look for the main character, Aura. Um, so, yeah. So I was very fortunate to work with, uh, so then I, uh, changed position. So instead of being a professor at University of Washington, I moved to Santa Cruz, California, and became a professor here at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I'm very happy to be here in the games program. Uh, and so I started collaborating with folks here. Um, I was very lucky to work with uh, Marcelo Viana Neto, who created um, the, uh, the model for the character that you see here for Aura, um, and collaborated with Adrian Phillips, who <clears throat> is a graduate of the uh, MFA in um, Digital Arts and New Media, where I also teach here. And uh, so Adrian Phillips worked on the model and also on the animations for Aura. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to share those poems, but also include movement, um, because so much of the poetry is about, about the body, about the feeling of not being able to breathe. Um, and movement's really important to me. Um, I'm really inspired by games like Bound. Um, Bound is a game where every move the character does is a beautiful dance movement. So, um, every jump, every turn is a beautifully animated, um, dance action, dance gesture. And, you know, when I see games like that, I'm just like, why, why is all this beautiful potential and movement so unused in so many games? Why are turns and leaps and moves so rote and similar and everyday when they could be incredible? Like another big inspiration game here was, um, Sayonara Wild Hearts, which, uh, I really enjoy it a lot and has some beautiful movement in it. Um, so I think the movement in my game is really, really simple compared to a lot of the movement you see in those games. Um, and to see how we did that, I can show this, this, some of this video to see some of the movement, which I think is some fairly simple movement that I decided on um, in this game that I did and videotaped and then had Adrian Phillips animate.
so um, those are some of the early movements that I did for this game. And then I um, I was invited to different uh, museums and galleries to show this game and to do the live performance. So I did. Um, and, you know, building on those early movements about not being able to breathe, about looking up to the sun and and grieving and looking up to where the moon should be and seeing it not be there, looking up to where the stars used to be and seeing them not there. I developed a longer series of movement that I turned into a performance that was around 30 minutes long that I did a couple of times, uh, once at the Leslie Lohman Museum in New York, which is pictured here, um, and then again at the Thessaloni Thessaloniki Biennial in Greece, and both of those were in 2019. Um, so here we also see the installation version of Scene Soul. So in the installation, viewers can walk around with the app, um, but the uh, the 3D scans that I did with Abraham Avnison are projected on the walls. So the soundtrack that you're hearing later in the game that you heard in that dance video very softly was by Wynn Greenwood, um, who's a sound artist I work with, who uh, I'm really inspired by, really lucky to work with her. Let's say everybody's names. So Marcelo Villaneto, Abraham Avnison, Morgan Thomas, Dorothy Santos worked on production for the game, uh, Wynn Greenwood, and Adrian Phillips. So um, yeah, in the installation version, we showed these 3D scans very large. Um, I'm not really happy with how those ended up in the game. Um, they ended up as these still images. Um, getting a point cloud in a very large point cloud from a very fancy LiDAR scanner uh, was really, was overly challenging, so I ended up at the, at the end just taking stills of it, unfortunately. But I would like to show some of it to you now, because Abraham Avnison made these incredible 3D scans of forests in the Pacific Northwest. So let's see a bit of that. So Abe's done a number of works with these um, LiDAR scans. And, you know, at the time when I bought it, there was, there was no LiDAR on handheld devices. We had to um, spend a chunk of research funds to go out and rent a LiDAR machine. And um, we, uh, we, went to, we went to different places in the forest. Um, this is near Cachis Lake in the Pacific Northwest. And um, I was thinking about, let's lean over here. I was thinking about um, environmental archiving as part of this project and part of this game. So with the increase in wildfires, um, we are facing the reality of losing much of the world's forests. I mean, we already have lost much of the world's forest. So part of the idea in Seen Soul is a future in which we might only have 3D models and 3D scans of forests. Um, and what, what would that be like? What might that be like? Um, so yeah, here's one of the beautiful 3D scans that Abraham Avnison made. Um, I wish we could have included them in a richer way in this version of the game, but, um, I found LiDAR to be a really fascinating technology. It, um, it uses a bunch of, a scanning laser to create a bunch of points and then arranges those according to a photograph, arranges those in 3D space. So I continued using LiDAR in my more recent work. Um, so what else do we see in Scene Soul before we move on? Um, the bright orange wall of the region, eyes of flame. Yeah, the, I, I, the sound that you hear there, um, three of those songs are my own. Um, the thing I'm really most passionate about these days or most excited about these quarantine days is uh, 
making music. Um, so you can hear those sounds and download the songs from this game on my Bandcamp page. Um, the ones from the game are indicated with scene soul in brackets. So that first song is Fog on the Ocean. Um, and uh, I made all those during quarantine after the quarantine had started. Uh, Fog on the Ocean I actually made for Annie Sprinkle and Beth Stevens' wedding where they married the fog uh, here in Santa Cruz. Um, but I also wanted to include it in the game. So we hear that song there. And um, also we hear this new story. So a new, new number of the stories in Scene Soul are real stories. So um, in 2017, also, some there were wildfires in Sonoma County, which caused undocumented people to um, flee, have to flee their homes. And because of news of ICE agents uh, or Immigration and Customs Enforcement agents at the shelters, they were unable to go to the shelters. So Democracy Now! reported a, a long, detailed interview about people having no choice but to run to the ocean for safety, to get away from the wildfires. What a horrific, sad situation that people should be so... People's life should be threatened just for not having the right paperwork. I find that to be incredibly unjust. And um, so I hope that you download Scene Soul from the App Store and uh, enjoy it and post a review, please. Um, or, you know, send me your thoughts and feedback. I really love to know more of what people think about it. I'm so honored that we won the Social Impact Award at IndieCade this year. Um, I was very surprised. I was very surprised and incredibly honored to win the Impact Award at IndieCade. Um, and I hope that we can submit Scene Soul to more festivals um, in the near future. Uh, but the for the last part of this talk, um, which hopefully is not too chaotic being a screen capture with sound, um, but hopefully is maybe enjoyable. Uh, I mean, glitch is part of the aesthetic here. I'm thinking about um, Glitch Feminism, Legacy Russell's brilliant book, Glitch Feminism. Thinking about that a lot these days. Um, and, you know, her idea of glitch being a kind of uh, feminist pleasure uh, and fem dash anist pleasure, uh, and a pleasure in uh, escaping and subverting the rules and logic. Um, if we think that um, the country that we live in, and thus the things created, many of the things created in it. Uh, are under a set of rules and logic that are white supremacist and male supremacist and cis heteropatriarchal, so privileging cisgender people and privileging heterosexual people, then Legacy argues, Russell argues, that uh, glitch can be a kind of joy and pleasure in escaping that, escaping those rules and logics that shape uh, computer systems, that shape uh, market demands. So even just looking at the table of contents, we can see glitch refuses, glitch is cosmic, glitch throws shade, glitch ghosts, glitch is error, glitch encrypts, glitch is antibody, glitch is skin, glitch is virus, glitch mobilizes, glitch is remix, glitch survives. Yes. Amazing. Uh, this book is an incredible archive of uh, queer and trans of color art and artists and big inspiration, like this work by Mark. Oh, I dropped the book. Uh, like this work she opens the book with by Mark Aguhar. These are the axes, 2012. So many amazing works of art in there. Um, but... Moving on from Scene Soul, thinking, continuing to think about and explore Glitch. Oh, I wanted to show one more thing. So we showed some outfits from Aura, but I forgot to show Roja. So Marcelo, um, this is my dog Roja, enjoying the Santa Cruz beach. 
Uh, Marcelo Viana Neto. Uh, here she is in the park. And uh, Marcelo created uh, the 3D models of her. Here is us cuddling. Um, Marcelo created 3D models of her, which I'm, I, I love, I think are so brilliant. And uh, they're in the game. You can interact with them. You can see them up close. Um, I think they have some glitches, which maybe will work out or maybe we'll leave there. Um, but yeah, here's Marcelo's incredible model of Roja. And, you know, I put her in there. I was thinking about Donna Haraway and when species meet and, um, you know, multi-species eco-justice. If we're not thinking about the survival of other species, we're not going to survive. It's just that simple. But also, just on a really everyday basis, you know, Roja keeps me alive and brings me joy in so many ways and brings me love and companionship and kinship and family in so many ways. Um, so... I hope that uh, whatever animal relations are in your life are also rich and life-bringing. Maybe you have a dog or a cat or a bird or a lizard, or maybe you just talk to the crows outside your outside your house every day when you leave. Um, those, uh, as many indigenous scholars like um, Leanne Simpson and uh, Kim Talbert and Nick Estes, Tell us, uh, you know, indigenous people have known for a long time that those relations are serious and important and, uh, you know, can be considered equally as important to human relations. So in thinking about how we can um, care for other species and care for the earth, I'm continuing to make work about climate change uh, to make another game another augmented reality experience, but this time really focusing on the ocean. Uh, so, da, 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 da. let's open some of the videos from Oceanic. And, um, yeah. So, Oceanic. I'm really inspired by um, Alexis Pauline Gum's writing in uh, M Archive and also in Dub, writing about the ocean in a speculative sci-fi way. Um, but also, in my own book, Poetic Operations, I've thought a lot about Edward Glissant's Poetics of Relation. My book, Poetic Operations, is coming out from Duke University Press next fall. Um, and... You know, I talk there in the beginning about poetics as something more than just what makes a good poem, as poetics uh, in Edward Glissant can be about poetics of movement, poetics of um, relation between people. What is the quality of our relationship and relations with each other and with the land and with the water? And how is that a kind of poetics? Um, Glissant's opening for this book the open boat I love and find very beautiful and compelling and um, he says for Africans so he's a Caribbean black Caribbean philosopher from Martinique he writes for the Africans who live through the experience of deportation to the Americas continuing the unknown with neither preparation nor challenge was no doubt petrifying and talking about the experience of those who uh, were thrown over sh slave ships into the ocean, into the abyss, against their will. He writes, This is why we stay with poetry, and despite our consenting to all the indisputable technologies, despite seeing the political leap that must be managed, the horror of hunger and ignorance, torture and massacre to be conquered, the full load of knowledge to be tamed, the weight of every piece of machinery that we shall finally control, and the exhausting flashes as we pass from one era to another, from forest to city, from story to computer, at the bow there is still something we now share, this murmur, cloud or rain or peaceful smoke. We know ourselves as part and as crowd in an unknown that does not terrify. We cry our cry of poetry, our boats are open and we sail them for everyone. That's Edward Glissant, Poetics of Relation. 
which I write about in my own book, Poetic Operations, forthcoming. Um, but another huge inspiration here was um, Gloria Anzaldúa. Is that 143? Oh, gosh. Here's the good chaotic part of this talk. Um, 243, not 143. Gloria Anzaldúa lived here in UC Santa Cruz. She is one of my biggest inspirations. She's a Chicana poet, activist, philosopher, um, and I really encourage you to read her if you have not read her poetry and books. And um, she wrote this essay about the bridges, about Natural Bridges Beach, which is the closest beach to my house here in Santa Cruz. And um, the essay is called Unnatural Bridges, Unsa Unsafe Spaces. She says, at sunset, I walk along the bluffs, gazing at the shifting sea, a hammered sheet of silver. A full moon rises over the cliffs of natural bridges like an op opalescent ball. Under my feet, pressure and heat are continuously changing the layers of sedimentary rock formed 100,000 years ago. It took the waves thousands of years to cut out a remnant headlands and thousands more to wear holes or arches through its flanks and shape three stone bridges. Year after year, these same waves expanded the arches until the weight of the overlying rock collapsed the outermost bridge 21 years ago. In a few seconds in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake brought down the innermost bridge. Today, only the middle one remains, a lone castle-like sea stack with an arched hole for an eye. <sighs> Bridges are thresholds to other realities, archetypal primal symbols of shifting consciousness. They are passageways, conduits, and connectors that connote transitioning, crossing borders, and changing perspectives. Bridges span liminal threshold spaces between worlds, spaces I call Nepantla, a Nahuatl word meaning tierra entre medio, or the space in between. So she writes here about the lack of trans people in the class, important feminist text, This Bridge Called My Back, and how she thought that was wrong. And um, the lack of trans women in that book, the way trans women were excluded from that big moment of women of color feminism, and how she tried to change that in her later book, This Bridge We Call Home. Um, as a trans Latina woman myself, this moment of reflection for her is incredibly important to me. Um, and, you know, she talks about conflicts within movements and really um, trying to repair and heal our wounds and trying to be that bridge between communities. And um, so with all of those rich things uh, in mind of Gloria Anzaldúa and Edward Glissant, I'm in a really exploratory phase of making a work called Oceanic about the ocean, thinking about the ocean as a site of, of healing, but also as a site of um, grief, of incredible loss and sadness of the Middle Passage. Um, and I think that with COVID-19 disproportionately targeting black people and Latinx people, uh, and indigenous people, the combination of that and the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Nina Pop and the subsequent uprisings that we saw this summer with, uh, incredible unprecedented mobiliz mobilizations for black lives and against white supremacy, it is clearer to me than ever that we all, <clears throat> everyone, all sectors of society have to reckon with white supremacy in this country and around the world and with the legacy of slavery. It's not an option to move on and act like it didn't happen. Uh, we need reparations. We need uh, an end to prisons, which continue slavery in different ways in this country. <clears throat> and we've seen prisons turn, uh, we've seen COVID-19 turn prisons into death camps in the United States with huge numbers of prisoners across the country dying. And there's so much here that I don't, I don't have words to share with you yet. I want to, uh, I've made some 3D LiDAR scans of Gloria's bridges, of the bridges at Natural Bridges uh, State Beach, 
and I want to show you those 3D LiDAR scans and I'm working on some new music to go with them and I don't know what's going to come of this project that is tentatively called, that is called Oceanic right now. Um, and my hope is for it to help us really find this intersection and wrestle with these issues of um, global warming global warming, warming the ocean dramatically, causing massive dead areas of ocean, sea level rise, which is potentially going to destroy places like this, coastal areas that we see here that have been here for so long uh, are disappearing because of sea level rise, which is caused by the warming of the oceans, causing them to expand. And that side of the ocean being, again, this place of healing and this place of grief and loss. So... Yeah, a lot to think about while you look at what does Gloria's Bridge look like up close? What does a 3D scan of Gloria's Bridge look like up close? And we'll hear some music that I'm working on. Mm -mm, mm -mm.
So let me just end with Anzal Dua's last paragraph. Uh, I hope this talk, this talk is pretty long. Whatever, we're online. It's a pandemic. <laughs> um, I love Gloria Anzal Dua. I want to hear more of her. I hope you do too. And then I'll wrap up. This is the end. She says, I descend down the steep bluffs to the tide pool terraces between sea and cliffs. Which is exactly what we see here. Those tide pools at Natural Bridges that she's talking about. Squatting, I stare at a sea anemone in a pocket of water on the pitted rock. Biologically, we're a single gene pool with minor variations and superficial cultural and genetic differences. We are interconnected with old life. I prod the anemone. It shudders and shakes, contracting into a protective ball. We all respond to pain and pleasure in similar ways. Imagination, a function of the soul, has the capacity to extend us beyond the confines of our skin, situation, and condition, so we can choose our responses. It enables us to reimagine our lives, to rewrite the self, and create guiding myths for our times. As I walk back home along the cliffs, a westerly wind buffeting my back, the crashing breakers scour the shoulders of the bluff, slowly hewing out keyholes, fledgling bridges in the making. Gloria E. Anzaldua, November 2001. So... I hope that this weird, glitchy, slightly chaotic talk was pleasurable to you and uh, maybe even inspiring. Uh, yeah, I love to hear people's feedback, so uh, tweet at me. I'm at Misha Cardenas, M-I-C-H-A-C-A-R-D-E-N-A-S on Twitter. Um, I'm so honored to be in QG Con this year alongside so many other awesome game makers and artists. And um, thank you so much for listening. And uh, I am grateful to be able to work here. And uh, I hope that wherever you are, you uh, are safe. And and uh, keep going. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>